Claudia Seisberger, Academic Director of the Global Private Equity Initiative at INSEAD. You've been carrying out a couple of surveys in the spring on private equity in Asia. What were the main findings from that? We stepped out to survey the most experienced investors and private equity investee companies in Asia. So both the LP and the GP side in Asia. The survey did not make a claim to cover all of them, but we consciously stepped out to find the most experienced, the most sophisticated um, professionals that have spent time in the region. Now, the findings from the survey were quite interesting. Whilst the growth rates are impressive for overall private equity in Asia, when compared with growth globally, we would like to point out that there's clearly a correlation between the growth in Europe and the Western world and Asian growth. So private equity has grown very much in line with the growth that we've seen globally and has maintained in terms of assets under management or AUM, has maintained a consistent 95 to 10% share of the total global private equity pie. I was a bit surprised that it was only about 10%. It is surprising because absolute numbers obviously um, always, uh, particularly in context with Asian and Asian economic growth, always uh, point to a much larger or give the impression of a much larger, much stronger growth. But we should not forget, whilst the overall economic outlook for Asia obviously is very positive, that economic growth does not necessarily relate to excess investor returns. I think the term that you use is uh, middling returns. It doesn't seem very inspiring to say that the, the returns are only middling. Yeah, very clearly. When we looked over, uh, in, uh, over the different time horizons, the results were quite, uh, quite different. Over a 10-year time horizon, returns of private equity in Asia are at best at par with US returns at about 6.97%. Uh, uh, European returns over the 10-year time horizon beat both uh, very clearly on the private equity side. Now that changes drastically when we look at uh, shorter term horizons. From five year forward, Asian private equity clearly outperforms both Western European as well as US private equity. Now again, a caveat to be thrown in, returns shorter than five years in private equity always need to be taken with a grain of salt, given the nature of private equity, given the fact that most investments have a horizon of five to 10 years. So we argue that anything shorter than three years as a time horizon, as an investment time horizon, is really not very meaningful in the private equity context. And anecdotally, at the Super Return Asia conference, it seems that um, uh, Western LPs weren't actually using their Asian allocations at all. Absolutely. Uh, even though they may have had 5 or 10% set aside. So what were the main concerns there? At the recent uh, Super Return Conference in Hong Kong, one of the outstanding differences to the last few years was that we had quite a few LPs visiting from the Western world that had to date not allocated to Asia as well. On the one hand, we have uh, quite uh, a strong inflow of uh, capital into private equity in Asia. On the other hand, we clearly have more to come. We can expect significantly more going is forward. Is it because of the risks that people aren't getting involved? Clearly, I mean, the risks in uh, emerging markets are, need to be taken into account. And uh, based on our survey, also expected risk premia for both, uh, especially for emerging Asia, are about uh, six and a half to six point nine percent higher than the risk premia expected for the developed world, for the Western world, which is acceptable. The one part that stood out from our study, though, was that the expected risk premia for developed Asia um, includes Japan, Australia, Asia Pacific, is uh, pretty much at par with the risk premia expected for uh, Western private equity. So there's no difference whatsoever. In terms of exit strategies in Asia, is it mainly through IPOs? Yeah, um, clearly, especially since the uh, financial crisis, the recent financial crisis, the um, success of the exits here in Asia has driven the um, yeah, perception or the success of private equity overall. 
we've uh, seen since 2008 exits here in Asia clearly, um, or IPOs in Asia, clearly outperform IPOs in the Western world by any, by any standards, particularly with regards to China. Now, obviously, exits are an important part in the equation of private equity. Um, without a, a, a regulated, uh, safe exit environment and clear exit uh, ideas, it will be very difficult to, uh, to continue or to, to, to sell the success, the potential success of private equity in Asia. Nevertheless, having looked at the um, development on the exchanges, IPOs clearly will remain the, uh, the top choice of exit for private equity uh, vehicles in Asia. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the Wild East at the Super Return Asia conference and presumably, I mean that's in part because it, it's kind of freewheeling, unregulated, but uh, people are going to get burnt in that market. It's a very hot market at the moment, but people will get burnt. A lot of new LPs um, showed up this year at the uh, private equity conference, new to Asia, new to emerging markets. At the same time, we see, particularly in China, new GPs, new general partners springing up quite regularly. So the question is, do they have the right track record? Quite a few of those companies do not have the track record that is required by some of those investors. So the investors will find it very difficult to um, find appropriate private equity firms that confirm with their due diligence standards that are obviously crafted based on the due diligence that can be done in Western Europe or in the US. There's some interesting comments at Super Return Asia that um, whereas in the West private equity has uh, had something of a bad press over the past couple of years along with hedge funds, um, in China everybody wants to call themselves a private equity firm or you know, a, a player in that, in that space. Clearly in China as well as in India to a certain extent, in the big economies here in Asia, private equity right now is clearly the flavor of the month. Therefore, as well, as I mentioned, the difficulty in doing proper due diligence on some of the newcomer GPs. Quite a few of them don't come with appropriate track records, uh, with background in the industry. And uh, it makes it very, very difficult for the LPs to choose a uh, well-diversified, moderate risk portfolio of private equity exposure to Asia. Why do you think it is that um, while China is quite a hot market for private equity, it doesn't seem to be the same sort of excitement in India? Walking away from super return, uh, one might think so. Um, nevertheless, I would argue that India has had a much longer history of the uh, listed market, therefore making it um, quite interesting from a private equity investment point of view. Um, looking at the two countries though, private equity has um, a very different profile between those, uh, between those countries. Uh, India has uh, a lot uh, more activity on the real startup VC venture capital side and quite a lot of activity on the medium to large buyout side, just simply given the nature of the economy. To be able to do a buyout, you need companies that can be bought out of a significant size as well. And obviously, to an extent or the other, also due to um, access, easier access to leverage. China is quite different. China, the, the focus is very much on growth equity late stage venture growth equity with very, very few, uh, very little activity on the buyout side. We expect this to change obviously going forward, but um, we will see how the buyout market develops as those growth investments mature and grow into potential uh, buyout targets. Now, obviously, the, the growth rates um, in growth equity in China have been, uh, have been fantastic. That part of the economy is the one that's driving the development in China right now. And that's what uh, drives the excitement that relates to China. And generally speaking, it's all down to valuations and pricing. Generally speaking, it's all down to valuation and pricing. And that's normally where we run into issues and problems. Um, valuing, evaluating and pricing an investment in an emerging market environment is uh, not easy. Benchmarks are um, at times impossible to obtain. Um, valuations are especially in an environment where quite a significant amount of funds are chasing a limited opportunity set of uh, investments. 
Um, valuations are very often driven by the entrepreneur on the VC side or by the, uh, by the company itself. Um, not necessarily by the, uh, by the GPs themselves. One GP at, uh, at the conference pointed very clearly out that due diligence very often has to be done in China within maximum two weeks, whilst the standard in the rest of the world would be anywhere from two to two, to two and a half months. So that gives you an idea the entrepreneurs are just not willing to have the patience to sit and wait until the GP has done the due diligence that he's used to. So what would your advice be to those uh, LPs from, from the US or wherever? Well, I think the advice is, um, is, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, take it step by step. Stay with the, uh, with the investors, with the GPs that you might already have a relationship with out of uh, from your prior investment expertise. Ensure that you do your due diligence, independent of how difficult it is to do. Depending on the markets that you move into then over time, that might mean that you build up local teams on the ground that start to build relationships that can bring in the information that just cannot be obtained by regular due diligence processes. Claudia Zeisberger, thanks a lot. Thank you very much.